submit a question and you do that via the chat, I will ask you to re-enter it into the Q&A box. So without further ado, I will turn it over to our speakers today. Um, on, on the panel is Carla Lewis, Carl Lois, excuse me, Professor of Geography, Universidad de Buenos Aires, Jordana Dim, Professor of History, Skidmore College, and Stephanie Stillo, Curator of the Lessing J. Rosenwald Collection and Armament Library at the Library of Congress. So thank you all for joining us and I will turn it over now to our speakers. I'll just say one word really quickly uh, before I turn the, the, the microphone over to Carlo Loire, um, who joins us. Um, we're joining you from three different places, uh, three different time zones, and uh, really wanted to thank Erin for the chance to talk with you today um, and to the BSA as well. Um, and we are about to present work that is in progress and we hope that you enjoy it. Carla, would you like to start us off? Thank you, Shardana. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks, Erin, for the invitation. I'm very glad to share with you part of this work in progress, as Shardana said. Mm, let me share my screen. And today I will talk about the place of maps in books. And the object uh, I will analyze is a book called Il Mondo e Sue Party, written by the Italian physician and geographer Giuseppe Rosaccio. And this book is just one among several other geographical books he wrote. The uh, slide right here. Um, as you can see here, El Mondo Elementare Celeste, Teatro del Cielo de la Terra, etc. In Il Mondo Sue Party, the title says that the book describes the part of the world, namely the continents, as well as the geographical features of all of them. It was a very popular and well known book as it proved the fact that many different editions were published in Italy and it broadly circulated at the end of the 16th century, mostly in Europe. For my presentation today, I will analyze two different editions. Actually, I won't analyze the two entire books, but a specific aspect related to the place that maps had in those books, how the place of maps in books changed from one edition to another and its potential implications. Obviously, maps, gravures, and other figures used to change from one edition to another, and that, that is not the point. I'm interested here in analyzing how the mise en page in general and the mise en page of maps in books involve many aspects related to the ways readers approach, read, and interpret the content of the book. Yet, yeah. Comparing just two editions of the same book, I like to discuss the different ways in which maps have been adapted to the economy of space in books. And by the economy of space, I mean all the decisions implied in the mise en page. Does the map deserve half or a whole page, which is the better type for the title? It is convenient to organize the text in one column as here, or in two columns as here, and so on. You can see here um, several options that are possible to lay out the page. The use of the space of a page, what I'd like to call the spatiality of the page, and what is also known as the page layout, is an absolutely relevant issue concerning the materiality of a book. One could even say that the spatiality of the page has a similar status as the type of paper, typography, etc. And my analysis here on the meanings variation associated 
to the position that a map occupies in a book assumes from a material culture historical approach that paying attention to the page layout would allow us and then would lead us to look at maps bounded in books beyond the content or literal geographical data of maps. Say that, here are the two books. On the left, you can see the one published in Florence in 1595, and on the right, the one published in Verona in 1597. The two editions are very close in time. However, between the publication of the 1595 and 1597, both the text and the maps changed. I point out just one example, the case of Spain. In the 1595 edition, the textual description of Spain extends for 32 lines without interruption and it occupies a full page under the title De la España Seconda Tabula de la Europa e Seu Confine Regioni e Reine. A tabula, by the way, in the early times, usually worked as a synonym for maps uh, and illustrations. So um, this is uh, of Spain, second illustration of Europe with its confines, regions, and kingdoms. Here, the textual description is beautifully written in an attractive prose. It is expected that the reader relies on the text to get an impression about how Spain is or how Spain looks like. The accompanying map, in contrast, has no title. And this is not the only particularity, and certainly is not the most important one. First, let, let's keep in mind that the most common way to display a large map in a book when the map is bigger than the page is by using the double page or folding map to facilitate viewing the entire map at a glance. However, Rosacho's uh, 1595 edition divides or splits several maps, including this one map uh, of Spain. He divides into two, one on the front of the page and the another on the back of the same page. Naturally, this placement makes it impossible to see the full map at a, one, at a glance, one glass. Even more, the fact that the two parts of the same image cannot be seen at the same time implies two glances indeed, both physically and temporally separated. This of a split mission page conspires against one of the most relevant premises of any map, as I just said, offering a look of the world, region, country, city at a first glimpse. Why? Because while a reader can or could cumulatively acquire and then retain information from a textual narrative developed on previous pages, he or she could hardly retain the first part of the map and join both parts in his or her mind. This has been proved by art historians Rudolf Arheim and Ernest Gombrich in different books when they demonstrated this impossibility in their exploration of visual thinking and cognitive skills. From this page layout, we could ask, was this an error, an error too expensive to correct, for example, or not considered worth correcting? It's hard to say uh, because we have no evidence to affirm this, but probably so because two years later, the 1597 edition resolved the problem. The map of Spain was published as a whole on a double page with its own title, Figura de la España. Again, why did the publisher respond to criticism to the previous editions? It could be. There is something else to remark. 
between the two editions, the text were also modified. In the 1597 edition, um, the textual description of Spain takes the form of lists of place names. The lists are organized according to geographic and topographic topics and features such as Fiumi, rivers, monte, mountains, capi, caves, ponte, bridges, among other small or sharp chapters, let's say. The information is very punctual and factual, not literally described. It. And it invites to look for it on the map, probably in a back and forth reading. The reader can read isolated fragments and decide the order of reading. The reader can jump from one chapter to another. There is not a linear argument or a description to follow. Somehow, the way of reading this text is similar to the way of reading a map. The eye is a flaneur on a map. From this example, I'd like to put the accents first on the fact that the mise en page makes part of the materiality of the book, and second, that consequently the mise en page is what makes possible, or on the contrary constraints, the understanding of the map. The mise en page of text and images has direct implications on the multiple methods that readers acquire, understand, and retain information. With the with this case, I wanted to call our attention to many questions which are pertinent to many other maps in many other books that, in my view, we should ask before wondering what a map says. For example, who does decide the map's placement and location in the book? What is the reason to print a map in a book in different ways in different editions? It is a decision taken by the author. It is a publisher's requirement. And back to the example analyzed here, another question more specific relating to Rosalcio's case, for example, was it an unintentional decision based on misnumber or miscounting pages, which was realized only after the printer completed the mise en page of the text, be, because this is a, really a worth, worth mentioning. The random factor might not be discharged. Not everything is the result of an intentional decision. And the over-interpretation is always a trick risk. So the, this is why my proposal is to consider multiple reader hypotheses before taking literally or take for granted what we believe map says. Because in, in reality, map do not say anything. We are the ones who make them speak and we will make them speak according to our reading hypothesis. So um, to end, uh, closing up, I think this example underlines how much we rely on unspoken traditions or conventions in the presentation of textual and graphic contents by breaking the rules. Thank you very much. Carla, that was a terrific presentation. Uh, timely as always, and um, leaves us with wonderful things to think about and questions to ask. Um, I will follow as the next speaker, and then Stephanie will wrap up this panel, and we look forward to your comments and questions. Um, I'm going to hope this works.
I had always get something wrong at the very beginning. So hopefully you are looking at um, the topic of my talk, whereas Carla really gave us a very uh, swift and effective introduction to how a single edition of a work uh, can challenge us to think about the importance of the role of text and image in books as container of maps. Um, I'm going to take us in a slightly uh, different direction as uh, I follow that line of argument. Maps I'm sorry, Jordana, I'm going to introduce her up briefly because we can't oh, see your screen. You can't see my screen at all. No, I just right. I see you, which is great. But all right, we managed to do something even newer this time. <laughs> there we go. There we go. All right. So, Perfect. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for the interruption. All right, I will start again. So following on Carla's uh, lovely and insightful comments of the importance of, of placement in many ways uh, of an image and text to challenge our understanding of um, any work that we read, I'm taking us to look at maps in a particular kind of text, specifically travelogues, where they've been an important element since the 16th century. I've been fascinated by their place in these works um, since I had the pleasure of spending a summer at the Newberry Library looking at maps and travel accounts almost 20 years ago. Um, and I've been looking at them ever since. Uh, the Love Affair with Rare Books dates even earlier to my undergraduate years where I had the pleasure of working in a wonderful rare books collection. So the task as um, the kind of study that Carla and I are doing and on which we've published a joint article has gotten easier in some ways uh, since that project began as more and more of the original editions such as the kind that we're showing you here virtually today um, have made their way to the small screen in increasingly what one would like to think of as complete editions uh, from cover to cover with color folded and unfolded pages and often when you display them but not always um, the appropriate size uh, between text um, original pages and those that are inserted. But a question that came up early on in our project um, was really the question of translation and for me, the, one of the questions that came up in my research project is how do these maps, do these maps travel from one edition to another? If so, how? And when they do travel, what gets lost or potentially gained in translation? So to look at that today, um, you're, you're bearing the fruits of some conversations that Carla and I have been having for a very long time and which Stephanie was able to join and which build on material documents that we were able to bring out at a workshop that was hosted at the John Carter Brown Library in 2019. Um, and on behalf of all of us, I hope I'd like to express our thanks to Aaron and the BSA for support for this project and for bringing you some of the conversations and thoughts that we've been thinking on. So, for my case study, I'm looking at what one could think of as one book. Um, that is the um, Relación Histórica del Viaje Hecho de Orden de Su Majestad a la América Meridional, a historic relation of a journey taken by order of His Majesty, the King of Spain, to South America. Juan and Ulloa were naval lieutenants, very young men, one is still a teenager, who spent between 1735 and 1744 most of their time traveling to, within, around, and back from South America as part of, for part of that time, uh, a French-led expedition to measure the arc of one degree near the equator as part of a scientific investigation to determine just how round the Earth was. The two young men um, returned uh, in their late 20s, early 30s, and like many who went out and came back, published their account. Their work in Spain came out in 1748, 
Ulloa wrote the Relación Histórica, a four volume work that came out in Cuarto. Um, and Juan took the role of writing the scientific work, their astronomical and physical observations. Both works were based on the observations and experiences of both men. They wrote several other works and they followed in very well, well trodden footsteps of going somewhere that Europe was very interested, coming back and publishing their account. Their work was first um, published in 1748, so within four years. And they made a strong pitch, although not on the title page, interestingly, to address history, culture, geography, ethnography, tradition, um, particularly indigenous or Inca culture. Um, and they showed as well as told what they said. As Ulloa wrote in his preface, um, that maps were part of the author's argument. They demonst were demonstrations and representations necessary for, in his words, the best instruction of readers of both um, and so they made sure to include many, many images in their texts. And I'm going to show you very quickly um, just a few, a sense of the kinds of things that you will find in them for like Carla. Um, I don't have time to walk you through all, but there were many works unsigned by them, but in their, um, to the best of my knowledge and understanding, all originally drawn by them, plans, um, bays, coastal views, maps on the geographic side, and um, plans of Inca and, um, buildings, uh, ruins, uh, images. At the beginning of every chapter, there was a vignette in each book uh, showing what the chapter told. There were plates showing people in their outfits, uh, and even a plate illustrating what was a essentially a, a reprinting of Garcilasos de la Vega's History of the Incan People. So there was a wide range of visual material in these. They made an effort um, to really show something for almost all of the topics that they told. And the work was a labor of many, many hands, but the only names that appeared uh, on any of the plates were those of the engravers and the ones who drew it for printing. Juan and Ulloa's names appear at the beginning. They discuss each other in the work, but they don't appear on um, the actual images. So to think about these images in translation and the work very quickly went into what we think of traditionally as translation from 1748, a four volume quarto book was published in Amsterdam um, in two volumes, sorry, four volumes in two. Uh, at the same size, uh, was published simultaneously in Amsterdam and Leipzig and Paris, the same French language edition, um, with the only difference other than the number of volumes that it came out in or could be bound in uh, was the title page, which indicated a different publisher. Um, and in English, it came out in 1752, uh, and then again in editions 1758, 1760, 1772, um, in an octavo edition uh, that was different in many respects from the original, and we'll get into some of those, um, and published again in Cuarto in Dutch in 1771 and two in uh, the Netherlands. So as you can see, there was interest outside of Spain in what these two brought back. And what does it mean to take their work and translate it? And particularly a work that was very interested in text and image and translate it uh, for a different readership outside the home country. Translation is a term that, um, Originally, if we go back to the OED definition, um, we think of it as moving from one language to another, but it's also the act of moving a thing from one place to another. And in this case, we're thinking about people who move from one place to another and bring back experience that they turn into observation and from that observation into something that they publish. And then we're also thinking about the content that they produce being, again, moved figuratively and also literally into new words, new images, and new containers. 
So thinking about that, um, I actually wanted to move back even before that initial one and go back a little bit to the manuscript. And here, the first act of translation, looking at the diary or the diario, the journal that the two kept aboard and of which a clean copy, that is a copy um, that was not the one they kept every day, but was prepared already as a form of manuscript publication. Uh, that's a copy that's held in the National Library of Chile, uh, shows a huge difference between the kind of information on the page uh, that happens in, a, in the journal and that happens in the book. So the first translation really is occurring from writing down observations day by day to synthesizing that information, um, getting 20 pages worth of text into a paragraph or two to begin the account that is published, um, that is a, an essence of that work. Um, so the movement during the collection of data, they're moving around as they collect it, they're text is moving, they're leaving a copy in Chile before they go home, translating at each step of the way. And when it comes to the publication, manuscript to printed page, what's interesting is the content is already changing. And I'm not saying this is an ur document, it is not the first thing that was written, potentially, but it is one that gives us a sense of how much work is going on. And in terms of the maps, what were attached in Ulloa's version um, to his diary, it was his copy of the diary that was left, um, was, were two maps, and here you see the second one. And by map, he meant the coastal views that he drew along the way during the travels. And here you're looking at the manuscript version left in Chile, which would have been one of several copies, and a version that appeared in the Relación Histórica as its fifth plate. So this is the fifth set of views. And what's striking here is how faithful it is in terms of organization of information. These are the same places that are shown, but there are many differences um, that you can begin to think about between color, handwritten, engraved in black and white. And if we zoom in just on one of the views, um, you can see that there's information that's included in the manuscript, uh, place names that are missing, you can see that the shape of the ridge of the mountain is different. You can see that the location of text and how you might read it is different. Um, so there is translation going on even in what I would call a fairly faithful copy. And that act is really an act, intentional act of selection um, and an act that is um, one that is necessary as one is moving from um, original manuscript to print. But if we take that act of selection that we see here and then think about, again, looking at these many translations that it goes through, um, I'm gonna zoom in and focus in on chapter two and its discussion of Cartagena de Indias and start thinking about what the text in the image can actually tell us about the map. And as you'll hear throughout this presentation, I'm as interested and unable in a way, in the same way I think you heard with Carla, to look at the maps without going to the text and going back to the map and going to the text, moving my eye, but also moving my brain um, through the page. And here, if we take a look at a single paragraph um, at the beginning of chapter two, which is a description of the city of Cartagena de Indias in today's Colombia, and zoom in on one phrase um, where they're talking about the map that is produced, the plan of the city of Cartagena uh, that they draw while they're waiting for their French colleagues to show up. They get there three months early, five months earlier than their, their uh, French colleagues, and they don't have any instruments. So what they do is they borrow from um, somebody else the, the, the instruments they need to be able to go out and make their observation. And what's striking here in this time is that the Spanish, uh, the original Spanish, and this is my not so great translation, describe that they borrow these because of the death of the engineer who owned them, whose son and other officials um, had those things. By the French translation, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, the English translation loses the death of this officer. And one might say that these kind of things are insignificant, but in terms of getting a sense of who these authors are and what they're hoping to do, there's a lot of emphasis that goes on to respect for other officials in Spain, respect for knowledge and expertise, 
respect for hierarchy, including the king. And those details, that sense of who the authors are and what they're trying to say gets lost immediately in that English translation. What's perhaps more perplexing and more um, necessary for understanding the maps and what we're about to understand about the maps that are included is how they then describe the plans that they're um, creating. So they also start out and the plan that they're going to present to you, they say, is confirmed based on a plan drawn up by Herrera and that they're adding missing elements based on what they observe. If you look at how this is translated into French and into English, that map authorship um, is changing substantially. Juan and Ulloa wanted to ratificar, to confirm. The French give them credit for adjusting, régler, which has a sense of correcting, not addition or confirmation. It's negative rather than positive. And the English gives them credit for drawing plans that is for initiating the act of drawing. Further, they say they're working based on what they observed. It's an observation, it is a statement of fact, and both the French and the English give them credit for doing something necessary. So here we've moved from acts of translation that are about um, selection to very important senses of interpretation that change the meaning and change our understanding of the creation of the object that we're about to see. And what is that object? Well, they say that Juan de Herrera drew a map. Unfortunately, I cannot show you Juan de Herrera's map, but in the Biblioteca Nacional de España, they have the map that I believe is the one that the published map is based on, a manuscript map um, made by Juan de Jorge Juan, um, that as you can see, looking at the engraving, it just tells you that they, they're related um, from the layout, the organization, the size, the information. One is attempting from color to black and white, from manuscript to print, to being a faithful representation. The number of locations are the same, the labeling of the locations change from Spanish to French, um, but they want to be um, the same. So there's an act of selection, but there's a, an act of good faith. And if using modern tools, we lay them on top of each other, they look pretty good. But what happens in the act of translation, and again, text and image are so important to be seen together, is that the cartouche, the title changes. And what changes again is Juan in the original describes his work as a, as a plan of the city of Cartagena drawn by himself um, based on a map that was made by Herrera. So here we're saying, yes, I recognize that this other man made the map. And it's surrounded by images that show the work, work of people on the island uh, as a colony of Spain and the work of map makers and all of their instrumentations. It's a story of process. This is a map that's the result of hard work. Whereas if you look at the cartouche for the um, plate number six in the book, there is no authorship. Instead, the credit goes to a map made by the order of the king. Again, they are respecting hierarchy. They're acknowledging work of a Spanish empire, of a collective, their military men bowing to authority. Herrera's name is therefore effaced and their own names is, are also um, effaced. Um, and the only thing that remains is a celebration in the cartouche, not of that hard work, but of the richness um, of the empire. So in looking at text and image together, I hope you can see there's a lot going on. In that act of publication, a lot of translating is happening um, for a Spanish audience. And when we take a look then at a map as a map, that we're not looking at it as a support to understand a textual translation as we've done here. Um, what you can see is as this map uh, that is a fairly faithful representation, an honest attempt to give you um, uh, a part of the story that Juan and Ulloa are trying to tell. When we move into the translation from the Spanish to the French, uh, there's a very interesting thing going on. 
here, uh, what you can't read, but I hope you can see is there are two long columns of uh, text on either side of the map. And there are now two cartouches, neither of which is illustrated uh, beyond a slightly decorative flair. Um, but what you do see is that those two columns of text um, are in two different languages, as the title of the work is, Dutch and French. So there's something interesting going on here. Again, it's a fairly faithful representation. But now we're being asked for a work that uh, is going to be read uh, in Amsterdam and Leipzig and also in Paris to be able to read it in two languages at once, something that is a very interesting adaptation. Again, it's not a perfect match, but somebody has done a good job of copying this plate. It's rare for the plates themselves to travel, although it's not unheard of. Um, there have been cases, there's at least one account I know of where the French plates traveled to the English edition, but in general, something is going to be changed or adjusted, if perhaps not lost. And if we take a look from the manuscript to the Spanish to the French account, uh, to the French maps, we can see that information at each stage for however much the, the engravers wish to be faithful to the original is going to get lost. Uh, number 26 on the original map and all of them is where the observations that Juan and Ulloa took place were made. Uh, number 15 was a monastery. And I hope you can see on your screens what I can see on mine, namely that the, the architectural detail um, is fading at each impression. The Spanish engraver makes a good faith effort to keep the trees, to keep the columns, to keep the roof lines. But by the French engraving, they're simplified diagrammatic drawings. And at each stage, um, that translation loses a little bit of information whether or not um, the authors of those maps are aware of it. So there is a slow effacement of knowledge that happens, even in what the um, French edition, or the French language edition, better said, is meant to be as close, as Hughes is close to in the chapters, in the structures, um, in the illustrations, in putting the illustration near the text, which is something the two authors um, insisted on for their own original. All of these things are there, but things are still falling away. And if we conclude by looking briefly at the English edition, um, here I'm looking at the 1772, but the plates that appear in it are the plates that appeared as early as the 1750s. You can see that here, instead of 30 plus plates, um, there are only, um, six. Um, and these plates, there are seven total. They add one, a map of South America, which is an interesting addition, which we're not going to look at. But what they do in these six plates that take illustrations and images and maps from the Spanish edition is they select, then they reduce, and then they combine. So the Spanish goal of allowing people to read the plate near the text, the chapter that contains text and image being the same is thrown out. Um, the a level of detail is again reduced. Even more things are going on behind the scenes with the, the illustrations. The text is in some cases move for the map of Quito, the plan of the city of Quito. There are a few elements that are retained, but the text is in the introduction to the plates at the beginning of the volume and not on the page with the map where there is nowhere to locate it. However, on the plan of Cartagena, which with which we are familiar, um, almost all of the detail is removed. There are almost no words on the plan itself. It is essentially converted here, translated, if you will, from map to image. Of the 29 plus 26 places that were labeled, so 55 labels on the, the first version, we're down to three. As a reader, why would the British not want to have the words on the page? Why is it not important to a British audience to read what's on the map? I can't answer that because I don't have access to the publishing records. And this is a call for everybody to keep those publishers records for all scholars like me to work with. And so we can see here that there is something missing. 
but there's something more subtle missing um, that goes back to the whole collection of plates. And where I would like to conclude is that when we see that this is all that the British had, these seven plates with uh, maybe 15 to 20 images um, that are substantially reduced in number and location to the ones that we saw in France and Spain, what's also missing is an entire category of plate. That is the coastal views have vanished. A substantial piece of time um, investment by the scholars um, and the makers of these, these books has gone away. So for a British audience, the definition of map has actually changed. For Juan and Ulloa, their mapping of their journey is depicted in those coastal views. And the only journey that's depicted on a map in the British edition is the map that comes out in front. And it's not their tracks that are shown, but the tracks of George Anson, an enemy with whom they're fighting in the 1740s in the waters across South America. And so for a British audience, the idea that um, maps need to be retained means retaining plans, means retaining Re retaining sketches of ruins, but it doesn't mean retaining what in some ways was the most important information uh, that the two naval military men brought back. So where does this leave us? I hope this leave us in thinking that translation is complicated, um, that it's a set of processes, not a single one, that it's not a linguistic transfer only. It's transfers of bodies, of experiences, of purposes, of formats, of contexts, um, physical and national and many others. Um, and it's also a chance to think about and an opportunity to understand um, form and content through comparison to understand how each of these volumes and works conveys not just the information um, on the page, but a meaning in a worldview. And it is impossible, in my view, thinking about absence, and I will leave you with an absence of words on the page, um, that the absence and presence, that to be conscious of what is present and what is not and what is fading is perhaps one of the richest ways to think about it. Thank you. Okay, so let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, let's see here. All right, hopefully everyone can see that. Jordana, I can still see you. So can you nod your head? Okay, great. Um, okay, so thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I know we are on uh, a time frame here, so I will, uh, I will do my best to get us through this quickly. Um, and uh, of course, thank you to all of the organizers and the sponsors for this. Uh, this is truly a wonderful opportunity uh, to come together uh, with such great scholars. So today I want to talk to you about a fascinating book printed in the early 18th century called the Physica Sacra or the Holy Physics. Uh, this book was an attempt by Swiss naturalist Johann Jacob Scheiser to use nature or natural science as a way to understand and ultimately defend Holy Scripture. Scheiser often called his work the Copper Bible due to its 761 impressively detailed engravings peppered throughout the 2000 folio pages of text. Every page of the Physica Sacra combined specific Bible texts with contemporary debates about zoology, botany, geography, mathematics, astronomy, and biology. Scheiser's analysis of Bible verse included dramatic engravings of landscapes, of uh, flora and fauna, of skeletons, tools, coins, and cameos, and really everything in between. Many of the elaborate border images encroached on the principal frame, creating an intimate and immediate connection between the explanatory text, narrative scene, object, and Bible verse. 
Now, there's so much that you can say uh, about this biblical encyclopedia, but today we're going to use the Physica Sacra to evangelize about Jordana and Carla's very fundamental argument that maps and books are not sovereign, but deeply and fundamentally intertwined uh, with both the text and images in books, both in and outside. So a little bit of a roadmap uh, for where we're headed. We're going to talk just very briefly about who was Scheiser um, and what is the Copper Bible, both uh, physically and philosophically, uh, and then how do you use it? Um, so very uh, quickly, and we're going to come back to this uh, map of paradise, which we will uh, dig into a little bit. Um, Scheiser was one of those great early modern scholars that doesn't get enough attention. So he was this pro prolific man of letters in the 17th and 18th century in Switzerland. Uh, and he corresponded with some of the most important minds uh, of the period. And it, it was really many of these minds that sort of, uh, for better or, or for worse, sort of spurred him on to uh, this project. Uh, he pioneered some of the first uh, extensive explorations into the Swiss Alps uh, in the early 18th century, so following in the footsteps of people like Conrad Gesner, um, and created one of the first natural histories of Switzerland, for which he became incredibly popular. He's perhaps best known for his work on fossils, uh, which uh, eventually became essential to our modern conception that fossils were once living organisms. Uh, so Schazer was closely allied with people like John Woodward, uh, who eventually adopted the theory that fossils were in fact the remains of uh, animals and plants that were buried during the biblical flood of Genesis. Um, and this, uh, many of these images actually make their way into uh, the Physica Sacra, including this one, that I like to call Salamander Gate. Uh, so this is um, uh, this is an image that Scheiser thought uh, proved the existence uh, of a human witness to the flood. It turned out to be um, <clears throat> an extinct um, giant salamander, um, but it uh, the salamander was eventually named after him uh, in recognition. So it all worked out. Um, so importantly, he founded uh, some of the first Swiss journals um, <clears throat> that were similar to the philosophical transactions of the Royal Society, and he also established a great deal of vernacular periodicals aimed at the general public. So he was really interested uh, in bringing the idea of natural history to wider audiences. So within sort of all of this, he decided to create this grand natural history of the Bible. So what is the Physica Sacra? Um, Philosophically, this book really conforms to the idea of the duplex veritas, which is a very medieval conception uh, that was adopted stringently by the Reformed Church, from which Schauser was very confessionally adherent. The idea is that God's revelation is revealed to man in two books. Um, obviously, there is scripture. But there's also the book of nature. So the idea that the natural world provides the best evidence for the divine. Uh, and this dates back to at least, uh, this theory dates back to at least the 14th century, if not really before that. Um, now, in regards to the duplex veritas, there were certainly many adherents to this um, in the 17th and 18th century. This is just a couple examples. But where Scheiser really stands apart and where his Physica Sacra really stands apart um, is his combination of of the duplex veritas with more radical early enlightenment theories of mechanical philosophy, um, which suggests that everything in nature has a process that can be explained with the help of physics and mathematics. Um, and from this philosophical viewpoint, everything in nature can be streamlined, it can be systematized and simplified, and ultimately it can be explained. And that's the, that's the really important part to sort of keep in mind. Schauser's method, though, for presenting uh, information was flawlessly enlightened. Uh, he relied on uh, rational questioning, on dialogue, on observation to prove the existence of the divine through nature. Now, I think the best way to demonstrate this is just by dissecting a page very quickly. Um, so this book is arranged by biblical narrative. Um, uh, each segment begins with a table number, <clears throat> excuse me, that corresponds to an engraving. Um, there's then a Bible chapter and verse. So here we are in the prophetic book of Jonah. Uh, so these notations are also included again in the table engraving. Uh, you'll note the text in the engraving is in both Latin and a standard Roman type, and then in German and an elaborated fracteur, uh, pointing again to this commitment to uh, vernacular interpretation and publication. 
Scheiser offers two different translations of biblical texts. So here we have the Vulgate and the Geneva Bible, um, and then a very lengthy assemblage of arguments about the natural history associated with this text. So here we have both the visual and textual elaboration uh, on the great fish that swallowed Jonah. So as you can see, Scheiser put a great deal of effort into these engravings, and it wasn't just about creating a marketable illustrated book, though this was certainly important as well. He wanted to create a moment of true observation for his viewer. And in the introduction, he argues that all the engravings must be made true to life and according to the most recent archaeological, historical, and microscopical findings, so the reader could engage in reliable observation. And in fact, Scheiser was in a very unique position uh, to bring all of these visual and textual resources together. So when he composed the Physica Sacra, uh, he was serving as the curator to Zurich's Kunstkammer, uh, or the Natural History Library and Museum, uh, from which he quite literally drew from to create the images for this book. Now, there are innumerable examples uh, of the Kunstkammer Library uh, throughout the Physica Sacra, but this is just one um, that is that is truly one of my favorites. So here we have Scheiser using Hans Sloan's illustration of nopal farming to elucidate Exodus 25, 4, in which God tells the Israelites to bring him an offering of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and fine linen and goat hair. Um, so as many of us know, the original source of the deep scarlet dye cochineal was a small insect that fed uh, on the prickly pear cactus or nopal that grows in the Oaxaca region of Mexico. Hans Sloan included a fold out engraving very famously uh, of cochineal, um, of a cochineal plantation in his voyage to the islands of Jamaica. Uh, in the early 18th century. And Scheiser deploys the image here to bolster his claim that the Bible uh, reveals, quote, the origin of the scarlet color, which is known to few people, where Scheiser actually locates in roughly the Sinai Peninsula. So very interesting. Um, he also takes the opportunity to remind the reader to ruminate on the way that the stinging needle of the nopal should remind us of the wounds of Christ and the deep scarlet dye of the cochineal insect with the precious blood of our savior. Now let's go back uh, though to our map, now that we have a little bit of a basis of what uh, this book is, this sort of interesting combination of natural history and devotional. Now I should note that uh, Scheiser uses both terrestrial and celestial maps in really fascinating ways throughout his work and they're really fundamental. Um, but what we're going to discuss now is just one example of the way he visualizes and deploys maps throughout his work. Um, so Scheiser begins his study of the location of paradise or the Garden of Eden by saying that there is more debate about the question of heaven on earth than anything else in the sacred books. And then he makes a joke, which I think is very funny. He says this is largely because geographers get involved in the conversation. So hopefully there are no geographers that take offense. So true to form, uh, Scheiser looks to locate paradise through the relative geogra geographic locations of the four rivers that flowed from Eden. So the Pison, the Gihon, the Heidekel, or the Tigris, and the Euphrates. Um, and this is per Genesis 2, 10 through 4. Now, it will be tempting to consider Scheiser's map in the Copper Bible as limited to that of an independent, dispassionate image, a visualization of a geographic reality best served through a singular cartographic rendering. Instead, the map ser serves the same function as the work's other interpretive images, which propel the reader into a much larger network of information, both in and outside of the Copper Bible. So deep reading and context, I think, are really important here. So the Paradisius map is deliberately situated in a much larger complex and textual, uh, <clears throat> textual and visual discussion about the fifth and sixth days of creation, specifically the creation of animals of the sea, sky, and land, and the creation of man in God's image. So each of these topics uh, have images and extensive texts that connect you to the biological processes of birth. So if you look to the borders here, you can see these, you can see processes such as the chrysalis of a butterfly, the maturation of a bird embryo, and the transition of a human embryo into a fetus. Um, and the Paradisius map is sort of nestled in between all of these images of creation. Like other images in the Paradisius or in the Physica Sacra, the map is more of a visualization of several arguments or debates rather than a fixed image. And I realize this is a really chaotic slide, but there's a lot happening uh, with this image. Um, the map would not have had 
universal appeal outside of Scheiser's text. For example, while well, it certainly makes sense to geographically, geographically locate the Black Sea and the Mediterranean, the location of Nebuchadnezzar's hydraulic experiments intended to bolster regional agriculture is a terribly specific reference uh, to this particular text in this map. Instead, the map is a synthesis of numerous theories presented by contemporary authors about the location of paradise vis-a-vis -vis the four rivers flowing from Eden. So as you can see here, the argument adheres to different letters and different combinations of letters, uh, all of which play off of one another to visualize this textual debate. However, the cartographic rendering of where all of this creation is happening is not meant to be viewed in isolation. The physical geography of the Paradisius map is visualized and elaborated in this adjacent image. So they're really meant as a pair. Uh, and the biblical passage here is, uh, and the gold of that land is good. Uh, there is delium and onyx stone. So here Scheiser presents a debate about the meaning of the Hebrew translation of delium visualized as either an aromatic gum resin for perfume and incense or, or pearls. So plant, animal, or mineral, that sort of fundamental question. Um, I should note, he does not actually resolve this debate, which is often the case and very fascinating. Uh, he allows things to be very open-ended. In a fascinating turn, the text suggests that the reader skip over to Exodus 16, uh, a passage that describes how God provides manna for the children of Israel during their 40 years of wandering through the desert. This becomes a quite tangled debate about language and translation, but ultimately Scheiser makes the argument that the Delium of Eden has a unique and in this case didactic visual fraternity with manna, which was supposedly the size of a coriander seed, but white in appearance, just in case you have not seen manna before. Um, though Delium, which it, he similarly visualizes in the Exodus scene that you can see here, Scheiser creates a conceptual bridge between the Garden of Eden and the historic wandering of the Israelites through the desert, which, by the way, can also be tracked on uh, the earlier map. Not that we need more examples, um, but the map also propels us still further into Exodus, uh, which depicts the onyx of Eden in the bejeweled breastplate plate made for Moses' brother Aaron, the first high priest of the Israelites. Uh, and then we can track the onyx stone uh, through the life and deeds of Aaron. So this is all a uh, sort of domino effect. So hopefully these modest instances offer an example of how maps and books, or at least maps in this particular book, are not solitary or sovereign images, but integrate into much larger networks of knowledge, in this case, a detailed study of the physical and geographical interconnectedness of the Bible in general, and the Old Testament in particular. The maps in the Physica Sacra played the same role as other images in the Copper Bible, as visualizations of textual interpretation. And it's only when they are read within the context of other texts and images, both within and outside the 2000 folio pages, that they convey their full meaning and significance. To view them as sovereign images would be to misinterpret their role in the project and to miss important navigational markers in Scheiser's larger information network. Now, uh, just in true closing, uh, if you would indulge me for just a moment, um, I believe there's also perhaps a larger point here about the way Scheiser is deploying, elaborated, elaborating, and recontextualizing images within the Physica Sacra. In drone photography and 3D modeling, it is difficult for us to understand the impulse uh, to compare, say, cochineal harvesting in Oaxaca with the Israelites' exodus from Egypt and the passage through the Red Sea. We are trained to think of images as either correct or incorrect within their presented context. Consequently, historical images become locked in a continuous comparison of what we now believe to be true or correct. However, Scheiser conceived of scientific images as malleable, visual tools that could be deployed in wholly new contexts to either explain or demystify the unknown. For example, Scheiser admits that he doesn't know for sure the connection between delium and manna, but the physical or the physical location of paradise, uh, but the visual and textual comparison and contemplation on the natural world brings the viewer one step closer con to conceptualizing acts of the divine. And importantly, just in closing, uh, Scheiser insists that other people employ the same methodology in his opus, which you can see here. To Scheiser, the Kuiper Bible was a conversation or a stepping stone 
to other authors who would elaborate upon his study of natural history as study progressed. Uh, in this way, at least in spirit, he was a child of both the early enlightenment and mechanical philosophy, as well as the later higher enlightenment philosophers that saw the world as increasingly contingent, varied, and unforeseen. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for the, those wonderful presentations. Um, we're gonna, I know we're at time and I wanna thank our captioner and our panelists for agreeing earlier to stay on for an extra 15 minutes so that we can take some of your questions. There's already one question in the Q and A. Uh, so I will read that now. And if anyone else has a question, please do type it into the Q&A box. So from Caroline Schimmel, this is a question for Jordana. Were the travelers alive when later editions were slimmed down? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I believe the answer is yes. They were certainly alive in the 1750s when the first slimmed down edition happened. <clears throat> Um, and that question actually raises uh, a point that, again, I think this is the kind of piece where you're, the book is not the only container we need to do the research. Uh, Ulloa was sent by the King of Spain in the 1749-1750 to um, do some spying slash other work in uh, France and Netherlands and elsewhere. And I actually think he probably had quite a hand in the creation of the edition that came out in Leipzig and Amsterdam, given how faithful it attempts to be. Whereas he was not in England, although he had initially been captured and brought there. And I think the edition there happened independently of him. I can't prove that supposition, uh, but, I, but I think there is, uh, the, the question raises this point of maybe there was a closer relationship between the author to the first French language translation um, that I think was the case. But I do not yet have proof or evidence to back me up other than the documents themselves. Thank you. Um, does, do any of, do either of you have questions for each other or? I can pose one also if, if there aren't any other questions for the Q&A. That was such a wonderful presentation. I know you all are sitting there with, with questions. So I can ask one. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how map removal from books affects your work, whether collaboratively or um, on an individual basis. And I'm especially curious about that because I'm a New Yorker. I go to flea markets, uh, one of the great pastimes of flea market <laughs> Uh, vendors is cutting maps out of books for people to purchase and frame and hang on their walls. And yeah, yeah, I, I don't like it, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that um, and sort of like the integrity of, of the object. Jordana, I would be really interested to hear your thought on this. I'm interested in Carla's, but I will speak for 10 seconds first. Uh, my thought is basically there, there are many thoughts. There are, for a long time, um, libraries had a very different policy, right? The Bibliothèque Nationale de France has a wonderful collection of maps and drawings that have all been removed from books, including the bibliographical trace of which version and edition and book they came from which complicates one's world as a scholar and is a testament to this idea of in map history that, that maps are standalone images and plates and were never in books in the first place. Um, so there's that challenge, there's, um, and many others. The second, a second challenge um, is that in the early modern period, uh, these instructions to binders are because people bought sheets of maps separately from buying the printed sheet. And each book is its own um, object. So even those that are quote unquote faithful may be bound or rebound. Some of the images may be there. They may bound, be bound at different angles. 
And so it's extremely hard before we get to the 19th century, unless you've looked at a lot of books in a lot of different libraries, to even begin to think about what a standard edition might be. Um, so it's hugely important and maps have, as our article talks about, rarely been cataloged. Uh, so they're also, you've got to go looking for them and hope they're there. Um, well, something similar happened in the Archivo Nacional, the Archivo General de Indias in Seville, because usually the, the manuscript documents were considered something quite different from manuscript plans. And for uh, conservation, the archivist decided to keep it separated according to the size, for example. So it wasn't, uh, in theory, a bad decision, but the purpose was to keep them in, in a good shape. So only recently, in, in, I think perhaps 10 years ago, that was started to be revised. And the other problem I, I identify is uh, the digitalization of maps, because even if uh, the materiality itself is not affected, uh, also it offers many options for scholars and researchers interested in details because we can zoom uh, and, and see details that are not visible uh, in the real size, but um, we are losing the idea uh, about the relationship between the map, the size, the place on the book, the relationship between text and image, word and image, and the paratext. Uh, there are many other things that we are losing without knowing. So we are not reflecting on that. We are not uh, aware of, of that. And that's also something to take care about. Um, the last thing I would like to mention is that there are also many other books with uh, maps are not so beautiful. For example, I, I've been working with the uh, school text so there are many other genres of books that are still uh, bonded together. So yeah, there are many situations to consider about uh, what is going on with the bonded images in books. Thank you. There are a few questions here now. Um, I'm gonna ask these two, which are for Carla together. Um, so are there advantages to displaying maps on non-contiguous pages? I'm thinking about information that gets lost in the canyon between the pages due to binding. And a follow-up to that is, were the same woodblocks used for two different editions or was a new single block cut for the same edition? I feel like those questions are kind of tied together, so maybe it makes sense to pose them together. Well, it seems to be the same uh, good block, but it's hard to say. Apparently, yes, it's exactly the same. Um, at least in the five editions I, I checked, but as I wasn't really interested in Rosacho's book, uh, my, my concern was about the, the images and the, the, the relationship between images and text, and I was comparing manuscripts books which added uh, printed maps uh cut it off from other books and all the, that migration or translation uh, as uh, jordana said so i i cannot say it, um i cannot affirm it really but apparently the the, the appearance of maps is more or less pretty the same Um, and, and is there, I'm not sure if that, does that cover the question also about contiguous displaying maps on non-contiguous pages? Um, 
well, the problem is that um, the the relationship between the textual description is hard to follow in an image where it's split in several parts uh, because it's impossible if you are not too familiar with the geographic place it's really hard to keep in mind place names um, topography and other geographical accidents so uh, in a book, uh, this type of book, which are supposed to be comprehensive about, about the world, talking about um, places that are really far away from the place where the reader is, um, it, it seems to be too complicated to understand the map, to read the map. The map seems to be a, mm, another illustration. As, uh, it could be any other else. Jordana, I asked Stephanie a question. I'm, I love the map and I actually love your design of all of those complicated things. You get an awful lot of information on a slide. Uh, but I'm curious about that, the map of, of um, paradise that you showed, there were lakes on there that did not look very realistic. Um, yeah. Especially the square one. The square one, so, yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. curious. Yeah, that you know, one uh, that, that comes from some of that information. Um... Yeah, I'm working. I'm really working with that square bit down there, right? So you've got the square bit that he uh, that he calls um, a loose translation is Neb Nebuchadnezzar's pit, um, which I think has to do, or you could translate it in several different ways of you know some type of waterworks which was, I think, what he's trying to convey with all of that, which would have been in sort of the southern region of Babylon at that point. Uh, and then south of that are featured marshlands. Um, now, the question is naturally, like, is he coming up with that himself? Or is that a map that he has found that already exists? Or is that something like he likes to do that he's hybridized, right? And so I am on the hunt. Uh, for that map. And so if anybody, if that looks familiar to anyone or anyone happens to come across a map of paradise, you let me know. Um, but it does have some distinguishing characteristics uh, that, that I'm hoping will make it that I can find it. But yes, that's 100% my question as well. And and that 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 square, that square little body, and I do think it's a body of water. Like for a while, I was entertaining the thought that it was something else, but I do think it's water. Um, so, so yeah, I'm I'm with you on that. <laughs> More to come. Well, that brings us to time for today. Um, I'm sorry to to cut us short, but I want to thank our panelists for being here and sharing their work. Um, I think this is a great opportunity also to plug the fellowship port program that helped to support uh, Jordana and Carla's scholarship. That's the Pine Tree Foundation of New York's fellowship in Hispan- in, Oh no, it is the Cartographical Fellowship sponsored by the Pine Tree Foundation in memory of Charles Tannenbaum. So thank you to the Pine Tree Foundation for making this possible through BSA. Thank you to you for continuing to share your work with us. And thanks to our audience for joining us and our captioner for doing their good work too. So take good care everyone and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Karen. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Good to see everyone.